Welcome to Asala's Black History Month Festival for 2021 and this evening's program, Diving with the Purpose, Recovering and Reexamining Our Roots. This program is made possible by our legacy sponsors, and we would like to extend a special thank you to them for their support. Leading off today's program is the co-chair of Asala's Black History Month luncheon, Dr. Sharita Jacobs-Thompson. Good evening. My name is Sharita Jacobs Thompson, and I bring greetings on behalf of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, ASALA, and welcome you to yet another powerful program. I, along with Dr. Gladys Gary Vaughn, have the distinct honor of co-chairing ASALA's annual Black History Month luncheon, which this year is the groundbreaking virtual Black History Month festival. The Black History theme for 2021 is the Black Family representation, identity, and diversity. We are glad that you could join us for this evening's program, Diving with a Purpose, Recovering and Reexamining Our Roots. We have a dynamic panel this evening that will speak about their experiences of being black divers and their role in investigating and recovering artifacts from wrecked slave ships and how their work broadens our understanding of the wider black family. So without further delay, I want to introduce our host and moderator for this evening, Mary Elliott. Mary Elliott is the curator of slavery at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. She co-created the museum's Slavery and Freedom inaugural exhibition. She is a member of the Slave Rex Project team, having served as a lead on projects in St. Croix and the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as in Africatown, located in Mobile, Alabama. Ms. Elliott is a graduate of Howard University and the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law. Mary publishes and lectures on topics in slavery and freedom, community engagement, material culture, and exhibition development. She has been interviewed by several media outlets, including CBS 60 Minutes, C-SPAN, Slate, BBC, Root.com, NPR, and National Geographic. Most recently, Mary curated and wrote the special broadsheet section of the acclaimed New York Times feature publication entitled The 1619 Project. Ms. Elliott has over 20 years of experience in researching and preserving African-American history and culture. So, we welcome you again, and please enjoy the program. But first, join us in a rendition of the Negro National Anthem as performed by the Festival of Spirituals, Lift Every Voice and Sing.
And now, enjoy a short video that illustrates the work of one of our panelists on the São José Paquete de África, a slave ship that the Slave Rex Project discovered off the coast of Cape Town, South Africa. African Slave Rex Project is a collaboration among six African and American partners to search for, document, preserve, display, and learn from shipwrecks related to the global slave trade. In February 2013, this international team of divers made new discoveries near Cape Town, South Africa, that with further study promised to identify the site of the Sao Jose, a ship that was carrying over 500 enslaved persons from Mozambique to Brazil when it wrecked in 1794. The Sao Jose site is a pretty interesting site. It's very dynamic in that there's a lot of sand movement on the site, so it's not a very easy site to work on. There's a lot of kelp movement on the site, and there's a lot of surge. Well, what's been exciting this year is we've been able to get on the site quite a bit and we have had our colleagues over from the States and they brought a new dredge head for us. So we were able to use a dredge head quite effectively and work on the site and open up a new area that we haven't opened up before. How was your dive, Kamal? It was great. Fantastic. Yeah. What yeah. did you get to see? Oh, I found uh, something of interest. It was a piece of... Uh, Iron slag, I think. It, had, it seemed like wood material. It had a fastener to it. And so, I don't know if it's significant or not, but maybe we can check it out a little further. We'll find out. This one here is, uh, look at that. Yeah, this is, we this is metal here. Yeah? Yep, that's all metal. That's all, like, all of it. We've got enough information uh, to actually say that this is direct, although we need, you know, we need much more clarity. And that involves what we're doing now, is to, to try find the smoking gun. Probably the most undocumented aspect of marine archaeology has been African uh, shipwreck sites. There's thousands of ships that was involved in the African slave trade, not in the not just the Atlantic slave trade, but in the East African slave trade in which the Sao uh, Jose was involved in. It came it was coming from Mozambique heading around the Cape as we speculate at this point heading to Brazil. Of course it never made it. So to document these sites, to bring out the stories of these Africans that was captured and put in these horrific conditions within the, the bowels of the ship, within the hole of the ship, and ultimately end up in a catastrophe such as a shipwreck. And just to imagine that agony, uh, that suffering, the pain, uh, is, is extremely uh, emotional for me and, and humbling to a great extent because it connects me directly with, with my ancestors and, and for me to be able to dive that site to just find uh, a, a tangible piece of artifact or information, something to, to raise their silent voices, to tell their story is an extraordinary thing. Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Asala Black History Month Festival. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program, Diving with a Purpose, Recovering and Reexamining Our Roots. The purpose of tonight's event is to feature a panel discussion that will demonstrate the good work of divers who seek to preserve the heritage of Black people through discovering and investigating wreckages of slave ships and salvaging artifacts from around the world. Tonight, we feature three panelists. And I just wanna make mention of one of our panelists who was supposed to be with us this evening, Kamal Siddiqui. 
Kamau unfortunately could not make it this evening. He is one of the lead divers, a master diver with Diving with a Purpose, as well as a board member of Diving with a Purpose. And so we send him our well wishes. He is missed, but he is with us in spirit. So let's go ahead and get started with our panel discussion this evening. The program will include features by three individual panelists, and then we will reconvene and discuss some of this important work as a group. So to get started, and again, my name is Mary Elliott. I am a curator with the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I'm looking forward to this next conversation, which is with Mr. Rick Powell. Rick Powell is a co-founder and board member of the National Association of Scuba Divers. His aquatic career started as a competitive swimmer at Evander Child High School in the Bronx. He served later in the US Navy under the Naval Special Warfare Unit. He found that he had a particular passion for recreational and scientific research diving. Mr. Powell taught scuba and served as a diving research officer at several colleges and universities, including in Chicago, South Carolina, Cali Southern California, and Florida. Additionally, he served as a consultant with the Miami-Dade Public Schools Inner City M Marine Project and with the development of MAST Academy, a marine science magnet high school. As a co-founder of the National Association of Black Scuba Divers Incorporated, Mr. Powell served as the founding president. He implemented the NAB's annual dive summit program. He conceived and carried out the laying of a commemorative plaque at the site of the Henrietta Marie slave ship. And he currently serves on the board of directors for the organization. Mr. Powell is developing a nonprofit foundation to sponsor and conduct a variety of activities and instruction related to marine sciences and aquatics in the Southern Florida area. Good evening, Mr. Powell. It's a pleasure to have you join us this evening and we're looking forward to the conversation. Let me ask you, what was the draw connecting for you, scuba, the water and our rich heritage? Can you hear me, Mr. Powell? Uh, I can hear you, but I was trying to, uh, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And we're looking forward to your words of insight. So let me repeat the question. What was the draw for you to connect scuba diving, the water and our rich heritage? Well, my career as a scuba diver, as, you, as it was previously mentioned, started in the Navy, okay? Uh, at which time uh, I served in, uh, in UDT SEAL uh, units with the United States Navy. Um, but my interest at this particular time, you know, is in recreational diving and scientific diving. So uh, uh, in that, in that in, as, a, uh, as a recreation scientific diver, uh, I, was, I was involved with, as previously mentioned, the Henrietta Marie uh, slave ship. And this is what we can talk about at this particular time. Uh, we laid a plaque down at the site of the Henrietta Marie slave ship in 1993. We attempted to do it in 92, but because of weather conditions, we weren't able to uh, lay the plaque down. So in 1993, we did put a plaque down honoring our ancestors who had, um, who had, uh, um, uh, um, successfully uh, went through the, uh, the, uh, the Middle Passage, who are our direct ancestors today. So uh, at this particular time, we like to talk a little bit about, about that. Um, so we, we put a plaque down at the site of the, at the slave ship, which uh, in 1993, uh, in, the, in the plaque reads, uh, speak her name and gently touch the the souls of our ancestors. So um, this is uh, what we're doing at this particular time. Uh, the, the organization has an annual summit every year uh, at which, time, which we usually go to different places and uh, we've, uh, uh, we meet new divers and uh, some of the, some of the you know, old divers. So, um, I don't know, uh, is there anything particular that you wanted me no, to speak about? No, but thank you so much. 
I'd have to say that your contribution to this field is tremendous because you really have developed the next generation of divers. And the one thing that always really was amazing to me with NABS is it attracted a cross section of people from attorneys to doctors to engineers and to be able to engage in this history through a maritime lens is quite powerful. So allow me on behalf of our audience members and those who came behind you to thank you for your good work. So thank you so much, Mr. Powell. And now we're gonna go ahead and join in conversation with our next panelist. And that is Dr. Justin Dunavant. Dr. Dunavant is an academic pathways postdoctoral fellow at Vanderbilt University's Spatial Analysis Research Laboratory. And he will be joining the University of California's Anthropology Department as an assistant professor later this year. His current research is in the US Virgin Islands and investigates the relationship between ecology and enslavement in the former Danish West Indies. Currently, of course, the US Virgin Islands. In addition to his archeological research, Justin is co-founder and president of the Society of Black Archeologists, an AAUS scientific scuba diver, and he consults for the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, which I have the pleasure of working with him quite frequently out in the field. So welcome, Justin. Let me ask you, why is this work important to you as a scholar and as a person of African descent? And if you wouldn't mind expounding on the importance of the opportunity to help provide pathways for young up and coming scholars. Definitely, yeah. Thank you, Mary, for the introduction. And, and I'd like to thank Asala as well for putting this, this all together. Um, this is a topic I think that's, that's close to my heart and close to the reason why I got into archeology span in the first place. Um, being an undergraduate student at Howard University, I got exposed to the field of archaeology, and it really exposed me to the fact that a lot of the historical work that we do that isn't based on documents is often based on material records, on archaeological work and artifacts. And I realized looking around the field there weren't a whole lot of people that looked like us, which meant that we didn't have control of the narratives, we didn't have control of the questions that were being asked, and oftentimes we didn't have control of the sites that were being explored. Um, I went a little deeper and found out to actually do that, you have to have a PhD in archaeology. And so I, I tried to commit uh, at an early stage at Howard to try to make that come into fruition so that we could then begin to build out a wider field of archeology span where we could have individuals exploring all the different aspects of black history that we need to explore. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's very critical. When we first started the Society of Black Archeologists of which I serve as the president and co-founder now, along with my colleague, Ayanna Flewellen, uh, there was less than 60 black archeologists with PhDs in the United States. Um, and I think there's probably that many black historians that come out of PhD programs every year. So there's, there's a, a big sort of disjuncture between how our, we're represented in the different fields. And I thought it was critically important that we not only have more representation, but 60 people can barely even scratch the surface of the many sites that we have throughout the United States alone to conserve and preserve. Um, so for me, that was of central, central importance. And then I think, you know, this larger question then of what it means to me as an individual, I think, you know, I tell people that, that our goal is to uncover the histories, the stories and the memories of our past that we've forgotten or that we haven't fully remembered yet. And that aspect alone, if you take the expanse of trying to understand our history geographically across multiple continents, and then you go deep and trying to explore it across what over 150,000 years of human history, uh, you've got a large task ahead of you. And so I think, you know, some of the work that I try to do is, is not only to do that archeological work to uncover it, but to make sure that we're actively building capacity um, so that uh, I tell people my mantra is to, to be unneeded at the end of the day. Um, so hopefully, you know, we can do that step by step and uh, you know, little by little. Well, thank you, Justin. And the one thing I'd say that's really powerful is we've heard from um, Mr. Powell, now we've heard from you and, and Mr. Powell, um, you know, just, very important, the work he's done with NABS. And then with your work and you and I working together um, with the Slave Rex Project, seeing that work from maritime archeology span to terrestrial archeology, span and then connecting the two and exposing young people to, these, to this field. Speaking of exposing young people to this field, 
Let's go to our next presenter, a really dynamic young lady, Dr. Alexandra Jones. Dr. Jones is the founder and chief executive officer of Archaeology in the Community, a nonprofit educational organization dedicated to revealing the various ways in which archaeologists uncover the secrets of the past. Additionally, she is currently assistant professor of archaeology at Goucher College. Alex has supervised archaeological research projects involving historic and prehistoric resources, and she has been an educator for more than 16 years. She's taught in multiple educational environments from primary schools to museums. She's obtained dual bachelor's of arts degrees from Howard University, my alma mater, thank you, Dr. Jones, in history and anthropology in 2001. And she obtained her master's degree in history from Howard University in 2003, then attending the University of California, Berkeley to obtain a PhD in historical archeology span in 2010. Dr. Jones worked for PBS's television Showtime Team America as the archaeology field school director where she directed field schools for junior, high, and high school students at each of the sites for the 2013 season. And finally, Dr. Jones, as if she hasn't done enough, serves on the District of Columbia's Historic Preservation Review Board, Board of Directors for the Society of Black Archaeologists, the Board of Directors for the St. Croix Archaeological Society, and is an academic trustee for the Archaeological Institute of America. And so let me ask you, Dr. Jones, I'm already tired just reading your bio. <laughs> Why is it important to you to train the next generation of young scholars who will contribute to interpreting our history? And then on top of that, in addition to training young people, you also have the pleasure of training educators. And so if you could expound on why that um, two-prong approach is so vastly important to you. So thank you, Mary, for the question. Um, well, I, it, kind of piggybacking off of what Justin has already said, um, representation is important. There are too few of us within the field doing this very important work. The only way to actually change that is by educating the next generation. So I actually teach as young as pre-K and I go all the way up to uh, uh, classroom teachers. So with that said, I try to catch them as they're young, get them excited. And I don't just teach them about terrestrial archeology. span We do um, teach them about maritime archeology. span uh, We actually have DWP that comes in and does video programs and um, has conversations with students as well to kind of teach them the full breadth that you can not only be an archeologist but you can also be an underwater archeologist. But in doing that work, I'm just one person. And so what I realized is that we actually need an army of educators to do this very important work. So I also train every summer classroom teachers um, what archaeology is. I do it at, um, at the um, Mount Pillar uh, landscape so that we get to talk about enslavement. So we have these very hard conversations around African-American life, resilience, um, and then I then take them armed with not only the history and um, tools to teach these hard topics, but I also teach them about archaeology and give them a chance to get their hands dirty. So it's not a theoretical concept. It's something that they've had an opportunity to actually get dirty and do themselves, thereby creating um, a new group of people who can help me do this work. And so that, like Justin said, one day I am no longer needed. And um, you have thousands of children being taught each year about archaeology versus just the hundreds that we have right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. And you know, it's really great to hear um, you expound on your good work. And for um, all of our panelists, Dr. Jones, Mr. Powell, and Dr. Donovan, you know, there's some things that come to mind for me. And before I, I start with some of the questions, let me at least share with you one of our audience members has asked, how do young people, how do you encourage young people to get involved in your work? And how can they find out more information about access to archaeology in the community, you, Dr. Jones, and Society of Black Archaeologists, you, um, Dr. Donovan? And then also, Dr. Donovan, um, knowing that um, our, our other panelist was unable to attend, Kamal Siddiqui, of course, we know that Kamal represents Diving with a Purpose, which is part of Mr. Powell's organization. 
National Association of Black Scuba Divers, but if you could expound a little bit on the role of diving with a purpose, how they really have been doing dynamic work with young people out in the field. So I'll start with you, Dr. Jones, if you don't mind, and then we'll go to Dr. Donovan and then Mr. Powell, I have a question for you momentarily. Sure, so um, you can go to Archaeology in the Community's website uh, to learn more about what we're doing. Currently, we're actually enrolling. All of our programs are free for youth, and that's something we often, um, or I don't often highlight. So it's a big thing to make it accessible and part of making archeology span accessible is getting rid of the barriers. Um, so we've been all throughout COVID hosting free archeology span uh, camps and clubs, and we actually have a new one starting in April. So if you go to the website, you'll see the link for that. But in addition to that, we have an educators page for educators where parents can also go and find lesson plans so they can do activities at home with their children. And we have a children's page where children can go on their own and also engage as well as an app for kids. So it's an application that um, students can use on their phone to learn about archeology. span Thank you. Yep, and I'll just I piggyback off of that. I, I definitely wanna give flowers to Dr. Jones and I'm just saying that when her youth program was created, when AITC was created, there was no model for it. And so she really built that out as what could be a model for educating, informing and, and encouraging young people all over the world. And so a lot of different people come to her for, for advice and guidance and, and for her programming. Every Saturday she was reading kids books. So I know that that was a, an activity a lot of people enjoyed. Um, so as the co-founder president of the Society of Black Archaeologists, I encourage you to visit our website, the Society of Black Archaeologists.com, um, www at the front. And there you'll find just some of the programs that we've been doing. Um, we've been doing a lot of webinars since the transition into Zoom. And we've been having very critical conversations around uh, Black heritage, not just in the United States, but all over the world in the diaspora. Um, and we've partnered with a number of organizations on that front, uh, the Winogrand Foundation, a number of archeology span centers around the country, um, and our colleagues in other countries. Uh, there's the European Society of Black and Allied Archeologists. There's uh, Negra Archeo, which is a group of Black Brazilian archeologists. Um, and then a number of individuals who are from Senegal, Martinique, and a few other countries as well. So we're really trying to be expansive in scope and really capture that full attention. Um, we partnered with the organization Diving with a Purpose very early on. Um, they reached out to us because they realized not only there were few Black uh, archaeologists working on land, but there were even fewer that worked underwater. Um, and at the time that they reached out to us, there was only one African-American uh, with a PhD in maritime archaeology in the country. And they said, we need to do something to change this and encourage more people to get involved. Um, so Diving with a Purpose, you can get more information from their website at divingwithapurpose.org. Um, and there you'll find uh, not only the, the work that they've done, but also more information about their programs. Um, our brother Kamal can't be here with us right now, but he's, uh, I'm sure he's, he's uh, I'm trying to channel him right now in this moment. <laughs> uh, they have two major programs that they actively run. Um, one is around coral restoration and the other one is around maritime archeology. span um, And those are actually uh, community science led. And again, I have to give flowers to that organization because again, there was no model for what they created um, in that field. And that was really taking recreational scuba divers, getting them trained up and beginning to do high quality scientific research on behalf of maritime archeology span and coral reef conservation. Um, and so that's how I got into scuba diving. They actually certified and trained me as a terrestrial archeologist to dive, uh, Dr. Jones as well. And through the partners with the Slave Rex Project, all of this was really able to come into fruition. Um, so I encourage you to check out those programs. Um, I can talk a little bit about Diving with a Purpose's collaborations with Slave Rex Project. Um, Mary, you can give me a head nod if you want me to do that. Um, okay, that's a head nod, so I'll do that. <laughs> so Diving with a Purpose has been working uh, with the Slave Rex Project for a number of years now um, in many of their what we call theaters. Um, so they've been working in, in Mozambique, um, helping to train local Mozambicans in scuba diving, um, and then participating in maritime archaeology projects for the search of a slave shipwreck off the coast of Mozambique Island. Um, tied directly to that, uh, they've, they've also been engaged in work in actually searching for that wreck and assisting with some of the scientific methods involved in that. Um, Kamal Siddiqui, as you saw in the video earlier, was very instrumental in helping to uncover and uh, do research on the South Jose, which was a slave ship that crashed off the coast of South Africa. Um, and they're also doing work in St. Croix, where I work, uh, partnering with the junior scientists in the sea, 
Virgin Islands Caribbean Center, uh, as and a number of other institutions. Mary's good at naming all these names. I'm very bad at it, but I love them all. Um, <laughs> and they've they've done a lot of work uh, partnering with junior scientists in the sea to actually train young people from the Caribbean Center for Boys and Girls. Um, in partnership in some cases with, with Dr. Jones's work as well. Um, and then finally, the last aspect of that is the Africa Town, um, which is ongoing work now that Mary helped to pioneer uh, with uh, many other individuals. And at that place, uh, Diving Little Purpose has come in and actually done an introduction to scuba for young people in Africa Town, Alabama. And Kamal was instrumental in helping to identify uh, the Clotilda, which was the last slave ship to enter the United States. And uh, I'll end it there. Thank you so much. And yes, Justin, that's great because um, you really expounded on quite a bit and we're thrilled to work as part of the Slave Rex project, which includes many of the partners you saw in the credits in the film. Um, and of course, the Smithsonian um, being one of the base for that. But then of course, George Washington University, Zico Museum in South Africa, the National Park Service, and Diving with a Purpose, all um, core partners involved in that. And Society of Black Archaeologists and Dr. Jones, Archaeology in the Community, really rounds the whole thing out. But it's a real privilege to work with these communities down in St. Croix and in Africatown in Mobile, Alabama. Mr. Powell, I'd like to just speak to you for a quick moment because I'd like to get from you here you've done this phenomenal work. You have created the National Association of Black Scuba Divers. You placed that dynamic plaque that will forever be there in the sea, in the water, identifying the site where the Henrietta Marie would have been interpreted as a pirate ship, but clearly was interpreted as, is now interpreted as a, a ship that imported or a forced migration of people of African descent during the transatlantic slave trade. As you look at these young people, Dr. Donovan and Dr. Jones, how does that make you feel knowing your contribution to bringing forward these opportunities for these young people? Um, the, 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 the National Association of, of Black Scuba Divers, which was uh, founded in uh, 1991, and our first summit, the dive summit that we had was in Fort Lauderdale, at which time we invited the people from, from the Mel Fisher Museum to bring the artifacts uh, from their, uh, the Henrietta Marie. Uh, and they, uh, they brought them and they were on display at the, um, at the, uh, uh, at the museum uh, in Fort Lauderdale, which, which is the, the, the Hall of Fame Museum. So the ship's bell and everything, at which time we decided that we wanted to go a little further and we wanted to put a plaque down uh, honoring our ancestors uh, who, had, uh, who had survived on the Henrietta Marie. Now the Henrietta Marie was a ship that actually came from Africa to the New World or here and sank off the coast of Key West, Florida. So, uh, so we were able to, uh, to go at, to the site uh, at the, uh, uh, off the coast of Key West, Florida, and put a plaque down uh, honoring our ancestors who had survived uh, and endured the Middle Passage. So that was uh, the beginning. So now, uh, at that particular time, some of our members, uh, Ken Stewart and Eric Denson, uh, who, uh, who attended that particular summit, uh, they decided to start the group, which uh, became the Diving with a Purpose for, uh, uh, group, which was, uh, as I mentioned, was started by uh, Ken Stewart and Eric Denson. Uh, and, uh, uh, Eric is also a uh, alumni of uh, Howard University. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, he started a group in the Orlando area, uh, uh, which was called Diverse Orlando. And that was a chapter of, uh, of uh, the, the, the NAB's uh, organization. So he and uh, uh, Ken Stewart uh, started a, a group specifically for the purpose of, um, of, of, of uh, underwater um, marine science and archeology. span And, uh, and, and so uh, uh, that is the, the diving with a purpose at which time, um, uh, uh, Sadiki, uh, Kamawi Sadiki also uh, was a part of that group. 
and uh, I'm sorry that he wasn't able to make it here because he could elaborate on the on the purpose of uh, of, of of the organization itself. But the organization uh, has been uh, pretty much uh, dedicated to trying to um, uh, uh, do underwater archaeology and and um, you know the work so. So, so anyway, you know, like yeah, like I said, I'm sorry that he's not here to uh, elaborate on that. But that has been pretty much our our mission to um, deal with uh, the the um, the the uh, underwater uh, the ships, the slave ships, and try to uh, give more understanding to the slave ships itself. So, uh, 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 and Sadiki did. The, at the at the beginning of the program, uh, they showed a ship uh, that Siddiqui was uh, was on. Uh, I I didn't have anything to do with that, but uh, Siddiqui uh, did um, uh, do, uh, do something with that. And now in the African um, Museum uh, in Washington D.C., some of the artifacts are on exhibit uh, from uh, the the um, the sad, uh, what the is this? Sal Jose, you are yeah. absolutely right. And thank you so much, Mr. Powell, because I haven't said anything. I've been so much enjoying listening to you all, but um, that was part of my job. <laughs> so if people wonder what happens after this dynamic work is done and, and that scholarship comes forward and these artifacts come forward and they're conserved and preserved and, and then comes the part where we have, um, we present it to the public. And so that public history, we do it in museums, we do it in public programs. Um, and so it's been a pleasure to work at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture with the work of Kamal Siddiqui and my colleagues and some of the folks that I mentioned that are partners with Slave Rex Project. We were able to borrow those artifacts that will go back to a Zico Museum in South Africa, but we will be looking at bringing in artifacts from various sites to so show the, the global, the extent of this transatlantic slave trade so people can really learn these stories, including we hope to tell the story of Africatown in the museum. So I had the pleasure of putting together that exhibition space on featuring the Sao Jose. So thank you so much, Mr. Powell. Before we go into some of the um, questions from our audience, let me ask you, Dr. Dunavent, if you wouldn't mind expounding a little bit upon your UC HBCU program, explaining what that acronym stands for, and also saying just a few brief words about the importance of post-secondary education and our HBCUs and the possibility of reviving the archeology span program at Howard. All right, Mary, you are good at putting 10 questions in one, so I'll try to answer. <laughs> I'm trying to just keep it fresh. You're doing good. <laughs> You're doing good. <laughs> I'll try to answer them. Uh, yes, all. So I cannot, under, I cannot overstate the importance of HBCUs in the work that we do. Um, I think all of us have attended or have, have gone through HBCUs, and it was imp uh, very critical for us, um, not only to spark our interest in the field, but then also to sustain that interest. Um, Howard University closed down their anthropology program soon after I graduated. And since then, there's been a big issue with uh, in increasing numbers in archaeology amongst ourselves. Um, so part of the work we've been trying to do then, um, myself and my, my colleague, Dr. Cameron Monroe at UC Santa Cruz, um, as well as later on, uh, Bill and Ayana coming on board, um, who are other archaeologists as well, uh, we developed a UC HBCU program. And this is a, a program um, through the University of California system. Uh, where they supply funding to encourage students from HBCUs to attend graduate programs in the UC system at any UC from um, UC San Diego all the way up to UC Davis. Uh, so we, we developed this program and turned it into a summer institute for archaeological training for HBCU students with no background in archaeology. Uh, we have gone through about nine students now through the program. We normally take about four or five with us every year. Uh, we bring them down to St. Croix with us. Uh, we were taking some to Haiti uh, with Cameron, but due to the political situation, we had to switch it all to, to St. Croix. Um, and we expose them to archaeology, uh, the very basics of archaeology, and then the actual physical excavation of the work as well. Um, so they, they spend some time with us in California and then come down to us uh, in St. Croix as well. 
Uh, they, they do the program, they are fully covered in their expenses, they're giving a $3,000 stipend over the summer. And then if they complete the program, the University of California system offers them a waiver of fees for the applications for graduate school. And if they're admitted, they're guaranteed at least four years of full funding, no matter what degree program they enter. Um, so it's really a great opportunity for us to build out this pipeline to encourage more people um, to join the field. So, you know, we've been we've been taking that death row model and saying, if you want to get down with archaeology, you're going to have to come to the West Coast and uh, <laughs> and learn with us. Um, but we're really trying to build that out as a space um, that we can actually have more critical conversations around what our place is in archaeology and what archaeology is capable of. Um, we currently have uh, Jewel Humphrey who is a Howard alum, who is currently doing her PhD at UCLA. Um, I'll be officially supervising our committee next year when I get on board. Um, and we're hoping to get a few more students as well. Um, Marquise Taylor is currently doing his PhD in history at Northwestern University. Um, and you know he went to history, so that's okay. We can always get historians to do archeological work with us as well. So we're looking forward to watching the program expand and to getting more people on board. You're on mute, Mary, sorry. Thank you. You like those historians too, right? We're... <laughs> yes, that's a good thing. And, you know, uh, Marquise is at Northwestern. He's with um, Dr. Leslie Harris. And, you know, Jewel, we're excited. She'll be with you at the University of California. And I just have to applaud you for, you know, the foresight you and your colleagues, um, you know, Cameron and, and Bill to think about how to pull together funding for this. And then of course you got seed funding for the um, Estate Little Princess through the Slave Rex Project, but look at what you turn seed funding into something even larger. And I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the good work of your colleague, um, Dr. Ayana Fluellen, who also founded Society of Black Archaeologists with you. And I've had the pleasure of working with both of you all down in St. Croix. So hats off to you. And I want to say one last thing um, regarding Mr. Powell's comments. Um, again, we miss Kamal, but we have to, as Justin says, you give roses to folks while they can appreciate them. And so we have to give our roses to Eric Dennison and to Ken Stewart for being the founders of Diving with a Purpose. They have to be so proud of all the many young people that their good work has been able to afford training for. So um, Dr. Jones, I wanna go to you real quick because um, I think it's really powerful what you're doing, getting things together in Africatown and what you've done in St. Croix. Um, in Africatown, if you could expound a little bit on your notion of what you wanna do with the teachers and how you have partnered with the University of South Alabama. Yeah, so currently um, one of the things um, that we're looking to do is not only expand archaeology and archaeology education, but also expand it specifically through the story of Africatown, because we want to give light to African American stories. I think oftentimes when we talk about American history, we forget that African American is American history and should be integrated um, in everyday American history. So one of the things that we're doing is creating um, lesson plans and doing teacher training where um, the lesson plans can then be used not only throughout the state of Alabama, but can be used throughout the United States to teach about US history through a scientific lens. So, com um, com mm, excuse me, uh, combining the uh, cultural heritage history with the science component, which is something that most school systems are doing is looking at how can we do interdisciplinary education and how can we teach in both, um, in both fields at one time. So, that's what we're um, essentially looking at to do with the Africa town. Well, that's really exciting. And I love the way that you are looking at incorporating, you know, certifying these educators, helping them use this as a professional opportunity. And it serves as an, um, an incentive to incorporate this um, history into the classroom. And that's very important considering the current um, racial, social climate, um, and the emphasis on inclusive history, which is why, you know, um, the longstanding organization of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History is so vastly important. Thinking about a time when Carter G. Woodson was really pushing to um, make African American history, it's American history, and placing it out in the landscape and getting everyone to understand its significance and helping us understand the American story, a shared history. 
So um, let me ask you a few questions that are coming in from our audience members. One of them just straightforward for you, Dr. Jones, is will there be a teacher summit in 2021? Yes. <laughs> so um, if you go to AITC's website and look under the educators uh, tab, you'll actually see um, we have started the process of taking applications. The one thing is in the past, we've always had 15 educators in the time of COVID that is not possible. Um, so the numbers will be drastically uh, smaller. With that said, if you're very interested, please apply now. <laughs> the earlier you apply, the more chance you have of getting in. Um, and it is free. We provide scholarships for all of our educators for the full week of training. So again, under that idea of we truly want to make this accessible and so that everybody has an equal opportunity and an equitable opportunity um, to be educated about archeology span in our past. Well, wow, we like that free. I don't know, you guys keep having that running theme of free, which is great. So um, let me go to you, Dr. Donovan, um, if you could, and I'm gonna give you a two part question. <laughs> so if you could um, speak to the um, relationship between history and archeology, span and then this is actually for both you and Dr. Jones, um, how are archeological sites um, identified? Um, prioritize. And I would have to say, that's one of the things that I'm really excited about. And that's why I said to you, Dr. Jones, in my earlier question about training young people who will be interpreting this history, because that, that lens now will be able to have a voice at the table to say, no, this is a priority. So um, Justin, if you could answer that first question, and then if you both would expound on that second question. Definitely, yeah. So I wear I wear multiple hats. My undergraduate degree was in history and anthropology. And in the United States, archaeology degrees are in the anthropology departments. Um, and that's really because archaeology, to get textbook definition, is the study of the human past through material culture. Um, and that through material culture is really one way that sort of distinguishes history from archaeology. But I say at the end of the day, you know, if we're using a Black studies or Africana studies critical lens, we're all doing you know, sort of the similar work with different different materials. And so that's that's sort of the main distinction between the two. Uh, we're trying to bridge those divides in many ways. So we have done archeology span panels at Asala before. Um, we've done some at National Council for Black Studies. Um, and we hope to continue that tradition as more of us are able to and, and build those bridges. Um, in relation to your other question, uh, which was regarding of how are these sites sort of identified and prioritized? Um, I think that's where we come in as scholars. Um, according to federal law, anything older than 50 years is eligible for a designation on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, that's a critically important date, especially now considering civil rights movement. And we have this idea of commemoration of civil rights sites that are not eligible for those nominations. Um, that means that they're also eligible for archeological study as well. Uh, so we need more archeologists now more than ever. Um, in addition to that, the, the prioritization of those sites tends to go either where the research scholars go or where the funding goes. And traditionally that hasn't gone towards African-American history in the United States. Um, so what we've tried to do again is to build out more students to begin to do this work. Um, originally the study of African diaspora was generally focused on the study of slavery because there was so much we had to learn and uncover. And that's where many of us sort of, uh, you know, cut our teeth, so to say, um, but now it's, it's becoming much more capacious. And so Diving With a Purpose, for example, has been looking at Tuskegee Airmen plane wrecks up in Lake Huron, up in Michigan. Um, so we can really begin to think expansively about what archeology span looked like uh, more contemporarily, as well as what it looks like underwater, as well as in land. And to me, that's the, that's the most exciting part. So Justin, I'll um, kind of build off of what you said. Um, a lot of us are, uh, the, when we're brought into archeology, span we're taught just about um, archeology span and, and it, it's that of the enslaved life. Um, I, have, I was one of the people at the benefit of, my dissertation actually was on a uh, post-emancipation site. So I was actually looking at a free African-American community, um, them building their life in um, Maryland and what that looked like and the struggles that they, they went through. So for me, um, it was, again, this opportunity that came up 
uh, to look at something that was different from what everybody else was studying at the time, which was enslavement, but to look and focus on the resilience of and what the coming out of this horrible situation looked like on a, on a community-wide landscape. And interestingly enough, um, I'm still doing that work. I'm actually involved right now with that community and fighting to save that community um, from possible destruction as well. But on a whole, it oftentimes priority is is based where funding is is also located and that that's one of the sad realities um, around what we're looking at i have another site that's coming into play in maryland as well but it's being funded uh, by a university um, literally the university in an effort to do social justice decided that they wanted to study the landscape of enslavement and their university was given the land um, that was a prominent, well-known plantation um, in Baltimore, but they came, the university came after, um, you know, everything going on with this farm, but they decided as part of their social justice movement that they wanted to look at the lives of African-Americans in that landscape and focus on the lives of those African-Americans in order to tell the story of the university as well. So a lot of times it's, it's very much based in um, funding and just capacity. There's just not enough of us to do this very important work. Well, so thank you so much. And and this is a question I don't normally ask, but it just came to mind. Um, everyone sees us and we are all of African descent, but um, sometimes when we're working, there is the assumption that non people not of African descent are um, averse to, they don't really wanna talk about this history and they are not as helpful, so to speak, or you know, um, don't want to engage in these hard conversations. I can say for me, um, there have been people who really have stepped up and said, you know, let's talk about it. Let's find a way to do this. I don't know where to start. I don't know if I'm saying the right thing. And so I've appreciated their honesty and also their sincere interest. And I'd like to know from you if that's been the case with you as well, because I think that's very important because it, we really do have to talk about, um, you know, how this requires everyone's effort. So um, either um, Dr. Jones or Dr. Donovan, you can answer that. And Mr. Powell, I am going to come back to you. So you're not off the hook yet. <laughs> well. I'll jump in right now. Um, the work that we're doing to preserve the site in uh, Gibson Grove in Cabin John, Maryland, uh, it's made up of a multi-ethnic group of people. We have preservationists, researchers, um, descendants, all coming together of all backgrounds, of all walks of life, having these real conversations about social justice, the injustices that have historically been had, um, and working to change and to fix uh, in basically doing that, that that work of redress, like fixing what was done in the past and, and changing it. Um, so I will say I've had positive and I've actually had accomplices. I mean, they are in the trenches, arguing, fighting, and they will quick to stop and say, is this the right way? Should I address this? And it's cute because they will do the work. Like, it's not like I'm gonna ask you, they researched and said, I've seen it said this many times by this many people, is this the right thing for me to you know, approach it? So we're having those rough, tough, hard conversations, but they are right there working alongside of us to save uh, this community. Um, so I've had positive. I'm gonna channel um, Kamal Siddiqui on this one and just, um... Just to remind the the sort of origins of diving with a purpose, you know, it started almost 15 years ago when Brenda Lazendorf, who worked for the National Park Service, Biscayne National Park, um, had word that there was a slave ship called the Guerrero that was out there, and she didn't have the capacity to actually search for the ship herself. You know, in scuba diving, you need a dive buddy, and there was only one park ranger at the time, which was her. So she said, "If I can train you all to actually document shipwrecks, would you all be interested in helping me to look for the slave ship?" And of course, Diving with a Purpose, at the time, National Association of Black Scuba Divers then became Diving with a Purpose, said yes. And that was really the birth of the organization. And so a lot of the training and capacity building within Diving with a Purpose has been done in collaboration with National Park Service, with Slave Rex Project, and now with NOAA, 
as well. So there's many institutions federally and locally that are involved in this work. So it's a team effort if we do it right. Um, and it, it takes everybody. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I have to say that um, I've even encountered people who were, who were, they did not want to talk about the history. And then based on how we approached it and how we started to discuss it, they actually said, you know what? I learned something while I was going through this process. And then I went back and started doing my own research because I wanted to find out more. So I think that's really great. And I'm really uh, appreciative that you all answered those questions. Let me ask you real quick, Dr. Jones, there are some questions coming through in the, um, in the chat. And some of them, some folks are asking if you wouldn't mind reiterating your website address. Sure, it's www.archaeology, uh, N-I-N, community.com. And you can go there and you'll see the links under each tab. So if you're interested in the uh, educator's training, you go to the educator's tab. If you're interested in the young archaeologist program, you go to uh, the youth programs tab to access them. Thank you. And then I have to say this, I have a question here that made me think of my... Um, <laughs> my engagement in the water. And I know Justin, you might laugh at me, but um, I recall when SWP, I went out in the water in St. Croix and I had, um, you know, I'm, I, look, I'm not even gonna lie. I'm one of those people that, yeah, I like to have a well manicured hand and pedicure done. And so I remember on the boat, someone said, you know, the barracudas are going to love your toes because you have on that sparkly nail polish. And I thought they were joking. And we went in the water. I see Mr. Powell laughing. And we went in the water. And the person who was partnered with me kept going like this. And I was like, what is he doing? And then I looked and there were all these barracudas following us. <laughs> and so I thought about that because one of the questions that came up, and I know the answer will be no, if you want to participate, and I assume they're saying participate in diving with the purpose or nabs, um, but you would rather stay in the boat and out of the water, can you do that? <laughs> now, I will say my response was, you can do that if you want to do Society of Black Archaeologists, <laughs> which is terrestrial archaeology, but also maritime as I'm seeing that grow. But Justin, would you like to speak to that? And Alex, Dr. Jones, um, if you could say a few words about your experience in the water, um, and then I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Powell. Definitely, yeah. I just remind people, you know, the work that we're doing again is a collaborative effort, and when we're studying underwater archaeology and maritime sites, that's expensive. Not just of the stuff that's underwater, but also the docks, the ports, um, the boats themselves. These are all aspects of the history that we need to explore and study. A lot of that can be done on land. Um, there's a lot of GIS work, a lot of digital work that needs to be done, um, not only to analyze these sites and analyze these ships and ocean current patterns, uh, but also to actually convey it to the general public and to a wider audience. Um, so there's a lot of work that's being done. I have to uh, acknowledge uh, North Carolina African American uh, Heritage Commission, which has been doing a lot of work on reinterpreting the Queen Anne's Revenge and its slave trading uh, passed with that, that ship itself and Blackbeard the Pirate. So um, in conjunction with Eastern Carolina University. So those are, are some ways that you can get involved. You don't have to get your feet wet, although uh, we encourage you to, to experience the water. And I have to, before anyone else says anything, I do have to say there's something important about, I know at Howard, it was, it was required for years that students had to take swimming. And it was, you know, the notion of getting African-Americans in, involved in swimming, learning how to swim in the water. So, um, you know, it's not so bad. I love swimming. I just, you know, I'm not, I'm not good with barracudas, but I'm sorry, Dr. Jones. <laughs> so I, I am, I guess, new-ish to scuba versus everybody else on this panel. Um, and I have to say, diving with a purpose, also, um, I, I'm definitely a product of them. Jay Hegler, um, definitely, uh, has stayed on top of me. Um, we've had a conversation as recent as two weeks ago because my goal is to become a master diver. So working with me on that, but um, I definitely say it's something that everybody should do and should be involved in. Um, this is the expansion and the elevation of my career because in order to teach children about maritime archeology, span you have to actually uh, get out there and do it. 
Um, so I would definitely say this is something that people need to explore um, diving with a purpose if you haven't and actually invest and look in um, potentially getting certified. Thank you so much, Mr. Powell. So let me ask you um, with getting in the water and the importance of African-Americans learning how to scuba dive and just your, your tenure in being with the National Association of, Na of Black Scuba Divers, what's been some of your most memorable experiences? If you could give me one beyond the Henrietta Marie, which I know really resonated with you, but is there one particular experience that stands out to you in your memory of your experience with NABS? Well, let me let me say that um, the NABS itself, we, ha we have a, a youth segment, it's called NABS YES. YES stands for Youth Educational Summit. And every year, just like the like, like NABS itself, they have, we have a summit where we invite youngsters. And, we, and most of the, 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 uh, the affiliated uh, uh, independent dive clubs, uh, chapters and stuff like that, they also have a youth segment, and we usually organize uh, a lot of a lot of the youth. And uh, at which time now uh, this has been going on. You know, Ken Stewart had it. Then uh, another instructor by, by by the name of uh, uh, oh my God, what is the woman's name from uh, from uh, um, uh, from Texas. Um, uh, uh, so, 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 so dealing with an ongoing aspect of learning and stuff like that, the youth, the youth summit plays a very important part in training youngsters how to dive and also dealing with uh, underwater archaeology, you know, and so uh, uh, that's, that's something that both diving with a purpose and NABS has put a lot of emphasis on. But now in, 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 in answer to your question in terms of um, memorable uh, uh, experiences and stuff like that. Well, um, I I started diving myself in uh, 1961, and uh, with the with the Navy. So I've had a lot of uh, interesting experiences, good and bad. Uh, 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 but but uh, I would say that probably uh, the shackles and stuff and dealing with. Um, that uh, from the Henry Henry and Marie has probably been uh, one of the most memorable things in terms of. In fact, when we when we put the we put the shackles on display, a lot of a lot of people you know they it brought tears to their eyes because they thought about about our ancestors uh, having brought uh, to the new world uh, in in those conditions chained to each other with shackles and stuff to their hands on the ship. And so, uh, you know, that itself uh, was something in terms of being very touching uh, to, the, to the individuals of knowing how our ancestors were brought to, uh, you know, this particular uh, country. But uh, so I've had an opportunity to speak at different uh, locations at schools and different affairs and, and talk about uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, transatlantic, um, uh, crossing and what have you, and you know, I uh, also, I don't know whether or not um, Gene Tinney is on this uh, on this broadcast, but but uh, Gene Tinney and another brother who has since made his transition, Howard Morris, they did a documentary on uh, uh, the Henrietta Marie and the slave ship and the transatlantic cr uh, crossing. And so uh, this itself, uh, you know, was uh, was was uh, I had sent something uh, uh, shackles in the sand. Uh, uh, Louis Hicks had said that there was some uh, uh, copyright issues and stuff like that, that. That in terms of not showing it because I wanted it to have cer certain segments of it shown here, but I don't know just what 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 the detail was. But uh, but yeah. But I would I would say that that most touching moments to me was uh, as I learned and, and got more involved in uh, in, in terms of uh, the enslaved Africans and uh, the 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 the, um, the, uh, the the slave ships that are now being researched and stuff like that. You know, I mean I've 
in the military, I've had some hairy experiences, but uh, the things that, that I'm particularly interested in now is trying to further the knowledge and letting some of our youngsters know uh, just what uh, was involved in terms of uh, some, uh, their ancestors and uh, coming across the Middle Passage. Well, I don't know if that answers your question or not. It yeah. definitely does. And thank you so much. And I have to say, you know, um, the piece that you wanted to show that couldn't be shown, I can say that just listening to you, um, you are, you really give a really powerful statement about your experiences. And it's compelling enough even for me to listen to you and imagine what it must have been like for you in the water to discover these things, to be able to touch these objects and to reflect on them in site, on site where they were found. So um, I deeply appreciate your sharing that about what was memorable to you because it is now memorable to me thinking about your experience. And I know so many other people wish that they had those opportunities. So. Thank you so much, Mr. Powell. And um, let me ask a, another me, question. Um, excuse me, but before you, let me, yes, let me show you. One thing that we had uh, possibly talked about some of the divers and, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the brother who was at, at Hampton Institute, uh, Errol Duplexis, uh, he was the only one that had a diving program uh, at a HBCU. And so now that is become an issue. I mean, you know, there, there's no diving going on at Howard. There's no diving going on in any of the HBCUs uh, presently. And that's something that I would like to see, you know, uh, uh, that uh, uh, a, a, a diving program along with underwater studies uh, with black studies and stuff like that, that would make it even better to have an accredited uh, uh, program where uh, uh, students could learn uh, scuba diving and learn also about uh, the, the, the Middle Passage and, and uh, the enslaved Africans. I really appreciate you saying that because that ties back to our conversation with Dr. Donovan about um, trying to revive the anthropology department at Howard University. And then now with these experiences with maritime archeology, span making those connections and doing exactly what you said, providing not only the, um, the experiences in anthropology, that training, but also incorporating the dive training with that. So um, Dr. Donovan, did you want to speak to that? Because it does, it's vastly important. And Mr. Powell, you're so on point about that. Thank you. Definitely, yes. And I would, I would just second that and agree. And if there are any administrators from HBCUs listening or any major funders, this is something that we're actively trying to push forward. So we encourage you to get in touch with us um, for more information on that. Um, I know a lot of people have asked, you know, how do I get involved if there's no dive chapters around me or if I don't know anybody? Um, I will say that National Association of Black Scuba Divers has chapters in pretty much every region of the United States, as well as chapters abroad. Um, so I encourage you to go on their website at nabsdivers.org and just research what the chapter is and find contact information and reach out. Uh, one thing about scuba divers is they love to get other people scuba diving. So if you just say, I'm interested in diving, oftentimes they'll pull you aside and get you in the water um, safely and comfortably, um, and then you can explore. And I think with diving and with archeology, span it's one of those things until you actually experience it, you don't actually know what you're, what you're missing. Mm -hmm. um, I always tell people, you know, my first dive experience, it was a shore dive. So we walked out the beach into the ocean and I thought I had been in the ocean before until we kept going past where I could actually swim. And then we started going down deeper to where I could actually dive. And that's when I realized there's literally a whole world underwater that mirrors this world on land. And you see insects that live underwater. You see sharks to some degree. For those of you who are afraid, don't be afraid. Um, and then you see shipwrecks and heritage and anchors that are underwater and that have been there for hundreds of years. So um, I encourage everybody to experience that. I'm glad you shared that, Justin. And um, the thing that I think about being underwater, my dive was, it was, it was really snorkeling. I haven't done the scuba part of it yet, but um, it was in about 60 feet, 60, 60 foot deep water. And um, it felt like flying. That's the thing that really stuck out to me. It felt like flying. It was very free, 
you know, it's, it, I felt very free underwater and it was just a beautiful experience. Um, but to be able to incorporate not only just that experience of being underwater, but also connecting with our history in that environment is really quite powerful. So let me ask this question. Um, is there a crossover, and I believe this is for you, Dr. Jones, is there a crossover between archaeology studies and genealogical studies of cemeteries in the South? So, yes. Um, essentially, what happens is, um, and what we're starting to see is a lot of the traditional records for death records, um, if the church is no longer around. If the all black funeral home, um, like we have a case where it burned down in the seventies, if their records, cause their paper records are gone, we end up turning to the genealogies. So in addition to that, we're looking at the family trees. We're looking at the newspapers. We're looking at the obituaries. We're, we're checking family Bibles. All of those sort of information actually gives us clues as to who was buried where and what time. So there is, um, there is overlap. It ends up being one where we actually end up relying on genealogists for a lot of background research um, for cemeteries as well. So yes. Um, in addition, I saw somebody who asked a question about uh, Los Angeles schools. Uh, AITC works uh, just about everywhere. We're based in the Mid-Atlantic, but we work everywhere. We've done programs in Atlanta, Detroit, and Chicago. So if you are interested in a program for your school, all you have to do is email um, AITC and reach out and just say that you're interested in a virtual program, and we can definitely do that and make it accessible um, <laughs> as well. Thank you. So let me ask you, there's a question um, regarding, and Dr. Donovan, I think you might know the answer to this perhaps, but it's a question regarding, is there an opportunity for young people to be engaged in the work with DWP down in Key West? Yes, so DWP has a, a youth program, Diving with a Purpose, uh, what they call it YDWP, and um, oftentimes the instructors say uh, the youth program is sometimes better than the adult program because they're, they're more qualified in some cases. Um, so we do have a, there is a program there, there are requirements, they do have to come scuba certified, um, but again, if you link up with your local dive chapter and get that training ahead of time, it's possible to get involved. Um, again, NABS also has the NABDS, which is the Youth Educational Summit. Um, they also do uh, impactful, powerful work. Um, I believe they were talking about doing work in Belize. So again, all of these fields travel internationally as well as locally. And, and that's a, another way for people to get involved with the youth as well. Well, I cannot thank you all enough for this very engaging conversation. You all are dynamic. I love talking with you. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> So I want to give you a round of applause. You're getting a virtual round of applause as well. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you to our audience members who have been listening in on this very meaningful, very substantive conversation about diving with a purpose and really reclaiming our history, rediscovering our history, so much packed into this one conversation. So now I'd like to share with you that following this discussion, we are going to see a wonderful film um, produced by two young ladies, the, the Shavers sisters. And this film was produced by Sydney, actually it's three siblings, Sydney, Lindsay, and Max Shavers. They are the sixth generation descendants of Peter Shavers, a free black man from Virginia who moved to Key West in 1860. Peter and seven, seven other Shavers men were among the earliest settlers of America's southernmost city. In 2020, Sydney, Lindsay, and Max began their work to reclaim, preserve, and share Key West's Black history. Key West's location near the Caribbean at the intersection of the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean makes it a historic juggernaut these young adults are committed to highlighting historic and cultural experiences on the island that often are buried in footnotes or lost in time. 
After the film or immediately following the film, there will be a performance by the Jackson State University Drum and Dance Ensemble directed by Dr. Lisa Beckley Roberts. And so I'd like to say before we close out, again, thank you so much. We tried to get to every question and then we, we got a little engaged in our own dialogue because the conversation was so good. But right now, I'm excited to go ahead and turn over to the film produced by the Shavers, followed immediately by the dance ensemble, drum and dance ensemble. So thank you so much. Key West is where we come to explore and discover all of the things that we never learned in school. Lessons that can be found on land and in the waters that surround this two by four mile island. Key West is located at the southernmost point of the continental United States. The island, or rock as it is referred to, is small in size, but mighty in its role as an epicenter of black history. From being a channel for slave ships, including the shipwrecked Henrietta Marie, to being a hub for black musicians such as Fats Navarro and Coffee Butler during the 1940s, Key West history is worthy of proper documentation. We've been coming to Key West since we were babies and have come to understand the richness of its black history as young adults, the history of our family and of the African diaspora. We are Sydney, Lindsay, and Max Shavers, and we grew up in Richmond, Virginia, the former capital of the Confederacy. History has always been around us, but mainly from a perspective that does not honor black people. We realize it is up to us to uncover the rest of the story. So during the pandemic, we decided to travel to Key West to explore a little. When we got to the island, we realized our journey from Richmond to Key West was similar to the one taken by our sixth great grandfather, Peter Shavers, 160 years ago. In the early 1860s, he and seven other Shavers men, all of whom were born free, left Bedford, Virginia to work as laborers in Key West. Soon after the Shavers men arrived, they were drafted by the Union to serve with Harriet Tubman and 125 other Key West men in the South Carolina Volunteer Infantry Regiment during the U.S. Civil War. We are truly re-examining our roots. Our personal connection to Key West is evidenced in the streets of Bahama Village that bear our family surname and the names of other prominent Black families. By the late 1800s, after emancipation, Key West became a haven for many formerly enslaved Blacks, Bahamian immigrants, and free Blacks in search of a better life. Key West Black families built businesses, churches, schools, like the Incomparable Douglas School, and served in political offices. They were educators, clergy, laborers, fishermen, turtlers, shrimpers, spongers, seamen, seamstresses, cooks, and housekeepers. But the history of Key West 
like many other black communities, is being threatened. Rapid gentrification and the rising cost of living are pressuring our once black Bahama Village neighborhood. That is why the reclamation and preservation of the history of black spaces is critical. Without preservation, future generations will have no record of the many contributions their forefathers and foremothers made. Florida folklorist Stetson Kennedy once said, quote, the buildings and cultures of Key West, like those of New Orleans and Williamsburg, are a national and global treasure to be cherished, cared for, and passed on to future generations, end quote. We are part of that future generation, and now it's our turn to recover, re-examine, share, and preserve the rich Black history and future of this American island. If not us, who? If not now, when? Dr. Lisa Beckley Roberts, and this is the JSU African Drum and Dance Ensemble, and this is JSU Arts. I would like to thank our sponsors for today's event, our legacy sponsors, the History Channel. 
AARP, Bank of America, Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated, Omega Life Membership Foundation, New York Life, and Johnson & Johnson. Our cultural sponsors, TD Ready Commitment, Denny's, and Merck. And our history maker sponsors, Fort Myer Construction and United Bank. Please be sure to join us for our upcoming programs. On Sunday, February 28th, join us for our Prince George's County, Maryland Truth Branch and Maple Springs Baptist Church of D.C. Cultural Education Experience Ministry host The Black Family and Education, featuring educator Charlene Dukes. And finally, join us for our closing event, Asala and PBS Books presents A Conversation with Ngugiwa Thiongo, Nubia Kai, Dr. Sundiata Keita Shajua, The Perfect Nine, the epic of Gikuyu and Mumbai, and the Black Family. Throughout the festival, music from the Black experience, including Lift Every Voice and Sing, performed by choirs and troops from historically Black colleges and universities that will punctuate each program. For more information on how you can be a part of these virtual events, log on to our website, www.asalh.org, or check out our Black History Month Virtual Festival Facebook page, or follow our Twitter feed at hashtag ASALH, or call us at 202-238-5910. We look forward to celebrating our Black History Month Virtual Festival with you in 2021.